Welcome to Money Mondays, powered by the Joseph Business School, where we bring you up-to-date money news for your personal finances and businesses. I am your host, Jill Thompson. Today on our podcast, we are discussing real estate with VP of Mortgage Lending at Guaranteed Rate, Catherine Okoro. She's a business professional, financial coach, director of financial literacy, renovation specialist, and senior mortgage loan officer. Catherine Okoro has taken her experience and knowledge from the mortgage banking industry to the community. She's presently celebrating 20 years as a residential lending professional. Catherine Okoro has educated tens of thousands of people and has helped thousands and tens of thousands build wealth. She's also known for starting a successful financial coaching program at City Colleges in Chicago. Catherine is a top producer in the financial industry as she's helped many families achieve financial stability by helping them become more financially literate, own homes, as well as own other real estate. Money Monday audience, help me welcome to the segment, Catherine Okora. Hi, Catherine. How are you today? Hi, Jill. I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. So Catherine, we want you to walk us through the process. When a client comes in to actually meet with a mortgage lending officer, what is the process? What do you do exactly? So the pro so when somebody comes to me, I'm a lender. So my job is to lend money, okay? So it would start out with somebody going online and completing an online application. They answer questions about where they hope to buy, how much money they hope to borrow. Notice I said the word hope. So they hope to borrow and they, you know, hope to buy. And, uh, and then once they complete that, they pro provide some preliminary financials, like two years of W-2s, uh, you know, two years of tax returns, most recent 30-day pay stubs, and most recent two-month bank statement. So Catherine, can you talk about really the, the market right now in general? Because it seems like just as soon as properties are being listed, they're either being sold within a day or a week's time. Can you talk yeah. to the market? What's going on? What do we need to know in 2021? The house prices, I mean, it is a seller's market, so there's a lot of competition. So if I had to say, when I talk to my clients, what I'm talking to, to them about is, you said you want to own, right? Okay. So this is not, this is not a situation where you lowball or let me see what they'll take, but you go in it to win it. You go in it to get it because you've got a lot of competition. So when you get out there, you want to make sure you have your pre-approval. You want to make sure you, you know, have an idea of what you can afford, what kind of payment you can afford. And then you, you go out there and you get it. The market is hot, right? It's on fire. There's a lot of opportunity. Um, and it's a great, great time to buy. Catherine, you mentioned something there. You talked about the fact that this is a buy, it's a seller's market and not a buyer's market. Yeah. Can you differentiate the two? What makes this a seller's market? Well, you know, in college, when you have this class, this economics class, and people say, oh man, I'm not going to study for that. I don't really need that. It's called supply and demand. So there are more buyers than there are sellers. That's what makes this a seller's market. I mean, a seller's market is that for every house that's for sale, there are 20 buyers, right? There's 20 offers. So that's what makes this, you know, is we've got low inventory and a lot of buyers. Yeah, makes sense. Totally makes sense. And so can we talk a little bit about what happened in 2020, right? So okay. during the pandemic, there were a lot of people who lost their jobs. Um, many of them are probably in jeopardy of either foreclosing on their property because they have not heard about the different programs that were available to them, or they are in a situation where they've signed up for these programs, but they really don't know what they got because they're talking about my payments are being deferred to the end. Can you talk to what happened and what's going on right now? Every lender that I'm aware of has a relief program, has a you know, two or three month forbearance or six month forbearance or a renegotiation. I mean, every lender has some something right now because this is this is not something that kind of uh, we could plan for. This is unexpected. On uh, many credit reports that I see, they say natural disaster. So this is considered a natural disaster. Uh, some industries are not coming back. People have actually had to change careers and the, they're like, man, is that considered an essential worker? That's what I want to do. You know, I mean, 
people are really trying to figure out plan B, but absolutely, if they're having an issue right now with their mortgage because of the pandemic, they absolutely should reach out to their lender and ask about any relief programs or any forbearance type programs, um, or, you know, or maybe they think, you know what, I'm in that industry that's not coming back. I've been thinking about changing careers. So maybe now's a good time for me to go back to school or to start that other business. Then maybe you want to think about selling before you get a, uh, a foreclosure or something so you can protect your credit and you can rebuild a lot faster if you're, if you're thinking right now and you make, um, you make the necessary steps to protect yourself in the future financially. Gotcha. So what are some down payment assistance programs that's available right now? Oh, wow. So, so we offer pretty much most of the down payment assistance programs that are offered in Chicago. We have all of the IDA programs. Um, there are a lot of other programs that come about, they, but they, once the funds are depleted, they're pretty much you know, gone. Um, but I'll talk a lot about the IDA programs because ever since I've been a lender, IDA, the Illinois Housing Development Authority, uh, has had down payment assistance programs. And I'm proud to say that we're one of the top lenders uh, for uh, the IDA program. And uh, we have a streamlined process to process down payment assistance programs through IDA. There's uh, a new program actually uh, that just came out really weeks ago. It's called the Smart Buy program where you can get up to uh, 40,000, well not up to, I wanna make sure I'm being clear about that. $40,000 of your student loans can be paid off. Total 40,000. So if you owe 60,000, that means you've gotta bring in 20,000 more. So you really wanna be below that. Um, but it's a great program for folks that have less than $40,000 in student loans and their price is basically it's 15% of their purchase price can be used to pay, you know, up their student loans. So that's a great program. And with that program, you get $40,000 to pay off your student loans if it's total and $5,000 for down payment assistance that can be used for down payment assistance or closing costs. Um, there is another there and Ida also has three other pro programs. I like to call them the triplets which is the forgivable, repayable, and deferred program. And so with the forgivable program, you can get up to 4% or $6,000. And it's forgiven after, you know, 10 years of living in the home or having it as your primary residence. And then uh, there's the repayable. Actually, now I want to go to the deferred. The deferred is you can pay it off or pay it back rather anytime within a 30-year period. So it's just kind of that boost that you might need. You can get up to $7,500 or 5% of your purchase price with that particular program with Ida. And then also there's the repayable. Now, the repayable program is 0% interest and it's for 10 years, $83.13 a month and you can get up to $10,000. That's good. So it's 1% of your sales price of $10,000. That's awesome. So if that person was buying that $100,000 house and they got the deferred program, it got 7,500, they probably wouldn't need any money for closing. That, that makes any excellent. sense. That's excellent. Yeah. So Catherine, explain this. Can you tell our audience what are land contracts and deed restrictions? <laughs> okay, so land contracts. So a land contract basically is when someone, I mean, they're, they're really popular now. They used to be really popular like in the 60s. Um, people really should make sure they have an attorney if they're gonna do a land contract. And a land contract basically is, hey, I'm going to buy this property from you. I, maybe I can't get finance today for whatever reason. And then the seller, in essence, kind of like becomes the lender. Um, I, I, have, I have two stories about one is a very successful land contract scenario. And another one is one to watch out for. And uh, one is I had a client who wanted to purchase a Victorian home. And, um, but she didn't want, but, but her, her husband was very handy. So he, you know, uh, he was handy and, uh, but the only way that I could finance them or any lender would be able to finance them to be quite honest was to do a rehab loan. And when the, she, she knew though that getting a rehab loan was probably going to cost her $150,000, $200,000 to rehab this Victorian home. So, but she really, really, really wanted this house. And uh, she couldn't get finance to buy it because it was not in habitable condition, but it needed just a few things like it had floorboards were missing. The, the, the foundation was a little off, you know, really smaller things that would make it habitable. So what the, she decided to do was they worked out an agreement with the seller and uh, the seller became the lender and did a land contract with them 
for 12, no, for 14 months. And they agree. And that, so basically during that time, they paid the seller and I can refinance someone out of a land contract. Wow. Okay. So I was able to help her get the money on the flip side because her husband fixed the property up. That's so cool. they got the property through a land contract. Her husband took that year to kind of fix it up while they actually, you know, uh, it was a, there was a deeded agreement and he actually did put her on the deed, but it was a joint deed agreement between the seller and her. And um, they paid him the mortgage, right? And they fixed up the house enough so that I could refinance them. And in 13 months, I refinanced them out. And the house, actually, the value had gone up by about $80,000, even though he'd only put about 20 into it. And then I refinanced them out and he did the rest of their work themselves. That's so that was a way they actually saved money without getting the big giant contractor bids, you know? Yeah. So that was a very successful land contract story. Question, now, for you, Catherine, does that, does that also apply to commercial property as well? So let's say it's a six unit building. You, Can you do that for a six unit building? I would imagine you could do it with any property. The biggest thing though, is you want to have a great attorney. Okay. And I can't, I don't want to, you know, put a stamp on if you can do it in commercial. I'm pretty sure you can. If you can do it with residential, usually the rules are a little bit, you know, looser when it comes to commercial options in terms of seller financing and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest thing I'll tell you is the house was free and clear. Wow. So when you do a land contract, it's not typically done when there's a mortgage on the property. It's usually a free and clear situation where, because, you know, like FHA loans are, you're not allowed to do a land contract if you have an FHA loan. You're actually, you know, it's, it's if you read the fine print within the mortgage documents, there are certain things that are allowed and certain things that are not. So that's something, you know, just to be aware of is that it's typically done when the home is free and clear. So um, I, the thing I do want to mention, though, about the dangers in land contracts, because I think with everything, there are pros and cons. So with the, with the um, uh, land contract in the situation where it was scarier is that I had a client, he came to me, he wanted to purchase a home, and he kept telling me that his mom was going to help him because she had a building and she was going to uh, do a refinance and pull money out and help him to buy a property for himself. And I kept asking, I said, oh, okay, where's the building and all this kind of stuff. So I looked it up like I usually do. And I was like, oh, what's your mom's name? And he told me his mom's name. And that wasn't the name that I saw that was the owner. I said, hmm, okay. And I said, um, I said, when did your mom buy the building? And he says, oh, she bought it in 2012. Okay. So I go, oh, okay. Did she buy it by herself? Did she buy it in a corporation or he was like, no, she, she bought it. Like I said, how much did she pay for it? Right. So, cause let me tell you what I was seeing. What I was seeing was that somebody, some entity owned the property, but he kept telling me his mom owned it. Hmm. So I started digging, asking more questions. I didn't want to alarm him. I didn't really know. Cause I, I was, I was just, you know, I, I didn't, I was, I was looking at the uh, Cook County recorded deed and I was not seeing her name anywhere. And I looked at 2012 and I saw that it was in foreclosure and some other things. And I said, are you sure she owns it? And he goes, oh yeah, she's owned it for, you know, seven years now or whatever. I said, hmm, who did she buy it from? And I said, how much did she pay for it? And he goes, oh, she paid $35,000 for it. And she, no, no, really. She pays her mortgage every month. I said, oh, who does she pay her mortgage to? And he says, oh, I'll get the paperwork. I said, can you show me, you know, her paperwork? So, and he said, yeah, and here's her deed and here's this. It was a land contract. Now he didn't know that it was a land contract. I'm not an attorney, but I remember I had that other client and I yeah. saw, I've seen land contracts before. And I said, um, I said, I think your mom is in a land contract. He goes, what's that? And so I proceeded to explain. I said, um, is she on the deed to the property? And he said, no, she owns it. And I said, no, is she like, does she have a deed with her name on it and all this stuff? So to make a long story short, no, she did not. And what I read in the land contract looked like the land contract was for 35 years and it never, like ownership never transitioned to her in the land contract. So I told him what I thought I was seeing and I, and I said, do you mind if I give this to an attorney to look at? Because I want to verify what, what this is or whatever. And so he was like, oh, no, please, please, please. So 
I gave it to an attorney and she verified, no, this is a land contract. This is a never ending land contract. Wow. And I said, you mean his mom gave somebody $35,000 and has been paying this for eight years and she does not own this property. And she goes, she doesn't. So I called him to tell him that she didn't own the building. He was upset. And he's, and he started, and he, he was like, I kept trying to reach them. I couldn't reach them. So, so then he started sharing more information with me. And that's when it started kind of making sense. Mom had lived in the building. The owner for, was in foreclosure. Some investors acquired the building from the previous owner and saw that mom, his mom didn't want to move. So they saw her as an opportunity and unfortunately they took advantage of her. And so, I mean, he never, he never, the son never went on to own the property. He actually was going to report it as a fraud case and stuff like that. And um, unfortunately, I don't think it really got anywhere because he didn't have the money to pursue it. And, um, you know, she just lives there. So basically she's just a very high paying renter. And because they kept selling off the, the, the mortgage that they put on it, when I looked it up, it had already been sold like seven times to seven different investors. She had no clue who these people were. She would just get letters being told, this is where you send your payment. And she's been paying for eight years or whatever, plus the 35, like was everything she had saved. And so basically she was scammed and she never owned the property. So the real thing I will tell you about a land contract is that one, you absolutely want to have a, an attorney. Two, they should never be longer than a couple of years, you know, maybe three years at the most. And a lot of times when you hear people talk about rent with option to buy, what the sellers are usually thinking about is some kind of land contract. So you just want to make sure that they're not all bad. It's just that if you don't have the financial wherewithal to understand what you're getting into, you absolutely need to pay the fee for an attorney. You know, don't cut costs when it comes to risk. Pay an attorney to make sure that you're protected. Because I always say this, anytime somebody writes a contract, normally it's going to be to protect themselves. It's not to protect you. So that's why you have representation as well as the other side. That's why in real estate transactions, the seller has an attorney and you have an attorney. So with a land contract, as long as you have a great attorney that is looking out for your best interest, it could be a, a great situation to really help you purchase a property maybe before you're financially as able, even if you can just pay the monthly um, expenses on it. Um, and, um, you know, to watch out because there are people that will take advantage if you don't know. And unfortunately that was a, that was a happy ending, you know, land contract story. And also one where unfortunately um, uh, this poor lady was taken advantage of because she didn't know better and she just didn't want to move. She had lived there for 16 years. So Catherine, what you're talking about is that there's risk associated with any investment that we decide that we want to embark awesome. on. And real estate primarily, I know for us, for in most cases, is the, the starting point for us creating genera generational wealth for our next generation and for future generations. Can you talk of an instance or maybe a story, give us a story of a client who maybe the odds were stacked against them. It seemed absolutely impossible because maybe they did not have the exact amount that they needed for a down payment, or maybe they didn't have the the... the the credit score necessary in order for them to even begin the process. Can you give us a couple stories of maybe some clients that you've assisted along the way where the situation's practically oh, yeah. possible? I, I think that's 50% of my client base. <laughs> uh, and, and they're all such happy endings. There was a family, this is last year, actually, this was last year, right like in February. So before the pandemic kind of, you know, really, like this is, we're in a pandemic, you know, before that happened, they were under contract and they were getting down payment assistance and uh, their credit scores uh, were okay. You know, they were borderline, but they qualified minimally for the down payments. The points couldn't go one way or the other. It was just like, they are right there. And uh, he was a counselor and she was like a CNA. Mm -hmm. And um, they had about $2,200 in the bank their lease was ending. They were actually referred to me by their landlord because she was, I think she was going to sell the building or something like that. And she said, you know, these are good, good tenants. Can you help them and see if they can 
possibly buy their own home. I was like, sure, let me take a look. So they qualified minimally for the down payment assistance program based on a preliminary review. Um, credit score is okay. Like I said, about $2,200 in the bank. And uh, very nervous, very nervous because they, um, they were kind of, I like to say robbing Peter to pay Paul, mm -hmm. you know? So every month that went by, their money was already, I gotta pay this, I gotta pay that, I gotta pay that, you know? So everything was like that. And, um, and I remember getting an updated bank statement and they had maybe $800. And they said, oh, because we just, you know, gave earnest money. And I said, ah, okay. I said, but you get paid again, right? You know, you get paid again. You got to keep getting paid again. So the thing about buying a house is you got to keep money in the bank. Mm -hmm. So when you get qualified at a certain point, you have to always kind of stay consistent with that. If you're getting a gift, even if you don't need it, you still got to get that gift. If you, you know, are like, oh, I need 10,000 and the numbers went down, you still verified that you still got that 10,000, you know? So that's the thing about lending is it still has to be, where you start is kind of where you have to end, where the numbers are are um, are situated, are, are where the numbers are. And um, as we were going through the process, we were filling out the paperwork for the down payment assistance. It can't, he got his, uh, and you know, their income limits with the down payment assistance program. So his verification of employment came back and he was over the income limit by $1,200. So they no longer qualified for down payment assistance. Hmm. it was devastating because they only had $800 and they needed about uh, $6,500. And um, like I said, it was in February, early part of last year. Well, what did we get last year? Didn't we all get stimulus checks for a couple thousand dollars a yeah. piece? So they wound up getting $2,000, I think, a piece, or $1,200 a piece. So if you add that up, that was $2,400 they filed their taxes and they wound up getting a $3,500 tax refund. So, and then they got a couple more paychecks. So they were actually able to purchase their home with their own money. Wow. What a blessing. Right on time. I know. So, right you know, time. you said what? It was right on time. You know, I was like, yes. And the seller gave it, it, it. I mean, it wound up being a total of like set of like 70 days because we went from doing this whole big down payment assistance loan to, oh my gosh, you made $1,200 too much, yikes, right? So we got to start the loan over because now you're using your own money. We got to get rid of this down payment assistance. We got to do all, we basically, I basically redid the loan twice. Mm -hmm. And to this day, they're homeowners. That's good. So that was, that was actually last year. And that was actually a blessing caused by the pandemic. They got that $2,400 mm -hmm. and that took them over the top. Wow. And they got a tax refund. That's no. excellent. That's a beautiful story. You yeah. know, I love what you're saying because oftentimes we allow our situations and circumstances to kind of discourage us from going forward or moving forward and what we desire, whether it's building legacy or even building wealth for our families. And I think it's, we're at a moment in time where it's, it's time for us to stop talking about having a seat at the table and just really go forth, trusting God to just make a way and that we will have our own tables, if not just the seat. Having a seat at the table for me is educating 10,000 people and knowing that 10,000 more people than last year know something else because they were introduced or met or came in contact with this lady right here, Catherine Okora. Yeah. That me having a seat at the table means that that prayer that I've prayed many, many times over in many different facets based on where I've been in life that they learn something, that I've learned something, that I got a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. It means that I don't take for granted where I am or where I will go because I want to make sure that my heart stays pure and clear on why I do this in the first place. Um, that's, for me, that's a seat at the table. It's when I see people doing good things in the community um, and, and other people are listening to them and they're changing lives, that's a seat at the table. Uh, I think a seat at the table are so many things. 
And getting back to my drive through example, I used to be about quick fixes. Now I'm about slow and steady wins the race. Now I'm about, and that's because I learned through experience that sometimes it's the thing that you get quickly without really thinking about it could be the things that hurt you the most. And the things that have taken me the longest to gain or to hold on to have impacted my life in the most positive direction, the most, you're going to get me crying. I'm not trying to cry, but I, you know, when you start talking about, you know, this me from the West side of Chicago, mm -hmm. single mom, helping all these people and the things that I've been able to accomplish. I know that I didn't do it by myself. And I know that I didn't do it without believing what I was praying. I know that. I don't think that. I don't guess that. I know that because I know who I am. And I know there are parts of me that are like, I don't feel like working today. I don't feel like dealing with this. I don't feel like talking to people. Even with all of, I don't feel like I'm going to sit up here in pajamas all day. You know, even, even at that moment, I feel like I'm making strides and movements and, and continue to have a seat at the table because there are things beyond my control that are happening. Yeah. So that to me is the seat at the table. I love it, Catherine. And I believe that what you have stated is actually a very beautiful place for us to end our segment today, which is one you talked about you yourself, you had your own goal where you wanted to teach 10,000 people this year. And so Money Monday audience, we are definitely thankful to have you as our guest speaker for today's podcast, where we are talking about real estate. But what I really enjoy most is the fact that you were audacious enough to have a goal where you would say that you would want to educate 10,000 people. But I also want to employ our our Money Monday audience to have a goal for themselves. If you know that wealth is something that you want for yourself, if it's something that you desire for your family, and you truly are about building legacy, be like Catherine, have an audacious goal to say that this year you're going to step out on faith, that you're going to actually plow a new territory, chart into like uncharted waters where guess what? You may not know anything, but I believe God has sent people like Catherine Okoro to be those vessels that can help take us to the next level. And you can see the sincerity and the passion and what it is that she that she does because she truly cares about helping you establish a legacy and not just a legacy, but wealth for your family, your children and your children's children. The Bible tells us in Psalms that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And why not allow real estate to be one of the many vehicles and vessels that can help to transform not just your life, but the lives of those that come after you. Catherine, can you tell our audience, how can they contact you if they are interested in beginning this journey? Because I'm sure after hearing this segment and hearing that you, the passion that you have around real estate, that they themselves are moved, if not compelled to be like, I'm ready to go ahead and have a seat at the table. Matter of fact, I want to have my own house where there are many tables because the Bible tells us too, he'll give us a mansion and fill it with all good things and good treasures. And so how can our audience get in contact with you? Well, um, the, the, I mean, you can email me at katherine.okoro at rate.com. Uh, you can, if you're like, man, I'm ready to buy a house, man, this lady right here, I want her to help me get my loan, you know, buy my house, woo, you know, uh, you can go to rate.com forward slash Catherine Okoro. And you can see my name spelled there on the screen. Cause if you put Okora, you won't reach me. <laughs> can you tell I've been called Okora a few times? Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, you can also, you know, send me a text message or give me a call. And you can reach me at 708-995-3080. And of course, yeah, my Facebook and LinkedIn and all the other Instagram. And we do want to mention, for those of you who are probably wondering, like, is this Catherine from WVON? Yes, it is. Uh, she was a former co-host on WVON for the Credit Hour of Power, where she was actually positioning a lot of people for the very thing that we're talking about right now, which is building generational and legacy wealth through real estate. And so if you don't mind, Catherine, we want to definitely thank you so much for coming on our podcast today. It has truly been a pleasure. And I mean, like I stated before, your passion and wanting to help us succeed in this year, it's 
it's it's a I mean it's commendable. So we just want to thank you for helping and having goals of helping ten thousand. You can definitely count us in your numbers to say that you have definitely imparted a word because I surely know for me I am going after some real estate in this year in twenty twenty one. So Money Monday audience, I want you guys to do the same thing. Be sure to submit your testimonies, uh, submit any questions that you may have to us at Money Mondays at jbs.edu. Remember, we are building for wealth in twenty twenty one, and we're bringing bringing a team of experts to help get you there. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to our Money Mondays team. Again, that's Money Mondays at jbs.edu. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button on our JBS social media and YouTube pages so that you'll have hear the notification once videos like this become available from experts and financial gurus like uh, Catherine Okoro to help you figure out where and where your niche is when you're as you're building for wealth. I'm your host, Jill Thompson. And guess what, guys? As always, it's 2021. And I look forward to seeing you prosper. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.